What's going on? This is Maverick Saber. Um, I'm a singer, songwriter, musician, performer. Um, yeah. Live from London. Live from London, yeah. Live from North London, yeah. Matt, can you just talk to me about kind of um, like growing up, was music in your family? Was kind of that performance element in your family? Yeah, my dad was a musician, uh, had been playing in bands and, and doing solo stuff for years. Uh, never full time, but always from my earliest memory, he was in bands. So uh, I was born in London um, and lived there until I was about four. So I don't really have too much memory of my early years there. But from very young, moving back to New Ross, I remember going to his rehearsals, um, which were upstairs in um, this old abandoned house that one of his friends used to live in. Well, it wasn't all the band and house. It was actually his mother's house. He passed you. It's a long, it's a long story, but it was, yeah, grand, old, yeah. it was an old post office, and they used to rehearse upstairs. And that was my first memory of being around live music because I was about four, four or five, and I used to go up there, and I used to just like I was kind of shy, so I used to kind of clatter around on things in the background where no one could see me. So he'd give me a little set of bongos or a mouth organ or something like that. And I used to, that was kind of my first kind of grounding in music, really. Um, so I used to just watch his shows and love going to the rehearsals and yeah, just love playing music from that point, really. And w w which of, are both, are both of, of your parents are, are Irish or, or is there kind of, uh, is one of them English or what situation there? Uh, so my dad, born and, born and bred in New Ross and Wakes, moved over to London. Then I met my mum. My mum, born and bred in Hackney in London, but her dad's from Kerry, so she was brought up in an Irish household. Um, and then obviously my dad's from Wexford, so yeah, yeah. And then so then growing up, like from from discovering <laughs> from what it sounds like your father giving you uh, pots and pans, being a bit loud during his rehearsals to giving you a yeah. Bit more, yeah. <laughs> and then did you, you got to see him playing live then and, and stuff like that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He was playing. He was always gigging for years and years. So we used to go wherever it was. You know, we'd go and if we could, we'd go and travel and watch his gigs. And if it was in the town, it would obviously be easier to go and see it. But yeah, kind of grew up. And not just that, really. It was live music in the house. You know, my dad, even to now, my dad's in his 60s now, even to now, he's he still writes regular. Like, he still writes sometimes more than people I know, musicians my age who are signed. So uh, it, there was always like, uh, one thing I'd always say is there was a purity that I was around for music from very young. You know what I mean? It was never about money. It was never about ego. It was never about anything other than the enjoyment of playing, the enjoyment of writing, the enjoyment of telling stories, the mm. kind of the history within the music. You know what I mean? So there was a purity around the music that I saw growing up in my household. And what type of music was he playing? Was he, was he kind of an all rounder, or was he in a genre? Uh, he was a bit of an all rounder, but he was made, my dad's a big blues fan, so there was a lot of like Woody Guthrie and um, like early rock and roll, like Chuck Berry and. Um, um, and then there was more on, like bits on the trad and the countryside, but my dad was my dad was mainly like a blues blues fan. I mean, there's a whole it's it's fascinating when you talk because there's a whole generation, and even now there's a whole generation of musicians in in, a, in every country, but they don't that aren't in kind of say the the charts or or, or, the, or the, the the radio, but kind of earned their living, you know, gigging and writing and spending all day rehearsing, and you know they're they're not in they wouldn't necessarily be viewed. By the public as musicians, it's only when you get kind of dig down and you kind of go, "Oh Jesus, yeah, extra Frank does that, or Barney does that, or you know, that's." Well, yeah. If 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 you think about how many pubs up and down the country, each weekend, each Saturday, each Friday night, each Sunday night, each midweek, Wednesday, Thursday, that does live music. That's a you know, there's 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 scenes and foundations and generations of musicians that all right, they might not be selling out bloody you know, the Olympias or the O2s or whatever like that, but they are kind of the backbone, you know, of our general intake of live music, you know, the buskers, the people playing in small pubs, they, you know, they're the foundation. They're like, the, in, my, in, my, in my opinion, a lot of them are the real musicians, you know what I mean? Because they're, they put in the actual kind of the real hours in the ground. Yeah. You know? And then when you were growing up then, kind of, was it like, was there time like through school or through, you know, was there... When did it kind of playing, you know, when did the real interest kind of emerge for you get in, in, in involved yourself? Was it always there through like primary, secondary? Uh, 
it was I, I think it, it started it started from when I started playing guitar and I was about nine. My dad taught me Stand By Me. I think it was Stand, it was Stand By Me it was the first song and then I think he taught me uh um what is it? Is it what's the song? Is it a Neil Diamond song, Hands of Gold? Is it Hands of Gold? I can't remember anyway, it was the same four chords, but it's Stand By Me was the first one that he taught me. And he was just like, look, I'm going to teach you four chords and that's it. You're going to have to learn the rest for yourself, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, um, and, yeah, I just start, I started writing songs then. And then as I got kind of like, you know, 10, 11, I would forced friends of mine into bands. I constantly, any, anyone who would be over the hills, I'd force into the, a band or I'd get them to bang some stick off a wall outside and I'd be banging tunes away. And that was, they were kind of my early years of like, it was performing, it was performing amongst friends and writing songs and be like, you sing this and you play this and I'm going to sing this. And and uh, and um, and then when, I, I was always writing songs um, and I was recording songs like on my dad's little sit up at home and stuff. Um, and then I got, I started, I started performing properly. I was in musicals and stuff when I was younger. I don't really, I don't, not really a big fan of musicals, never was, but because I was the only one who could really, like, had a, choir kind of like a choir boy voice I'd always get ended up <laughs> ended up in these musicals which were which were wicked because you know even at, at the time I wasn't really a big fan of because I don't like music and songs in, in, in general but I got to play with like um, you know a lot of live musicians in it and got to harmonize and sing with other people so that gave me a great a great grounding um, which I really didn't appreciate properly at the time because I was listening to like my dad's records from upstairs and I had to go in and sing Oliver Twist I wasn't really Finding the same passionate balance, you know what I mean. Yeah. But um, but then after that, I started to get into hip hop properly around, I'd say, 13, 12, 13. I started to get into hip hop and started spinning and started writing verses, okay. and then and then started performing from there. Really, started putting music up online from fourteen. I was putting music up. I was producing hip hop beats first, and then I was just recording verses and choruses over it. Didn't know there was any Irish hip hop scene at all mm. I'd heard of Collie I think I remember I'd heard Collie when he released his album his Anim Dom but I, I didn't know that there was a scene behind it I just heard that one album um, years back and I'd, I'd only heard a tune or two off I hadn't really been introduced to it properly um, and then put my stuff up online and um, I remember the first gig I ever got was from Dean Scurry who's from mm. Rally Mon and they were running a he was looking after Urban Intelligence at the time and there was another group from Waterford called Correct Minds um, from Tremor. And I had a gig down there and I was 15, just gone 15. Wow. And then sat, and then I was still in school at the time. So that was it. I just started performing from there. like, And then I started doing like, uh, um, I think around that time I was doing like a couple of the girls schools, like end of year things and coming up and spitting and stuff like that. Hilarious stuff, but yeah. <laughs> and Kabir, was it like, take me back to kind of say when you were in early secondary school then and late primary school, like 10 and 13. What, so your friends were kind of into this as well, which it wasn't something that you had to try and convince them to do? Or nah, really? nah, it was convincing. It was me basically wanting a band. And right, I used to sit and I'd write like for any school stories or anything, I'd write, I'd write stories about me being in a band winning MTV awards and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, and then this song that I wrote passionately about Sarah Michelle Gellar or someone, some actress at the time, I'd be like, it was always love songs, you know what I mean? It was like, I'd write and I'd, I'd write all these mad stories. So it was my kind of like, it was me forcing them in. They were music fans, most definitely. Sorry, who were you listening to back then? Uh, so when I first, I kind of went through different stages. When I first, like I'd say my first years of properly listening to, to music, um, I was listening to early Beatles, Beach Boys, um, bits of Fats Domino, uh, my bits of Ray Charles. These were just through my dad's record collection. Um, what else was I listening to? Um, certain bits of soul music and early Chuck Berry and stuff like that. And it was kind of like that early rock and roll yeah. that I was getting into. Um, and then when I was like maybe like the 11, 12-ish, I went through a period where I was listening to a lot of like, I wouldn't say heavy metal, but there, there was something like, I was probably listening to what everyone was listening to at the time as well, like Limp Biscuit and, and um, Linkin Park 
And then I was more, I was like listening to bits of like um, Stained, Marilyn Manson, Puddle of Mud on the more popular side of things, on the heavier side. Um, Saliva, uh, Godsmack, stuff like that. Yeah. And then um, was always had like, I'd always as well in the background be listening to like, because my sister was a big R&B fan, like garage fan, because she left London a bit older than I did. So she, I would always have all the garage tunes, as well as listening to heavy shit. I'd always have all the garage tunes of going off in England at the time. And like Lauren Hill and Destiny's Child. And, um, and then I suppose when I was about, it was about when I was 13, I started to get into um, like Tupac, yeah. Eminem, um, Wu-Tang Clan, Nas, um, they were probably my first introduction to the hip hop side. It, it's, it's fascinating there because you're saying there about, you know, it strikes me that there seems to be a very, very openness for you to try anything. Do you know what I mean? Did you kind of, even though you weren't into musicals, you, you jumped in and did Oliver because it was, it was an opportunity there to do some stuff or you, you had a wide range of, you know, listening. They, 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 you were kind of, even though you might go, oh, that's not really for me, but at least you, you kind of give it a go. Yeah, yeah. I always, and I think like that's, that's kind of like down to down to my parents really as well like of, of how early I was introduced and what kind of music I was introduced to it was never like this is what you need to listen to I never apart from my dad playing like blues in the house a lot and playing writing his own music on the listening side of things it was not I don't remember necessarily growing up having to listen to anything it was yeah. more like but I, I remember them saying like yo we've got a record player upstairs that we don't really listen to anymore just go up I remember being told not to touch a couple of records because I was young. They were like, don't touch that Japanese special Rolling Stones edition that we... I was like, all right. So I remember them. But apart from that, it was just... Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of free. And at the time, I wasn't really like... I was never... Even when I was young, I was never really listening to what everyone else was listening to at that age. But that's don't get me wrong. I got grabbed by certain dance tunes and stuff like that, but... The majority of pop stuff wasn't really my kettle of fish when I was that age. And was there kind of a circle of friends ar around that? Was there other, were there other people that you can knock around with that kind of had that same interest? There was, yeah, like on the Beatles, there was one or two friends of mine that were Beatles fans. And then when I got into hip hop, of course, there was more people that got into hip hop. But there was definitely certain areas when I was listening to music that were kind of my own space. You know what I mean? Like the Beach Boys and Fats Domino and certain little moments and a lot of the UK stuff for years took a lot of convincing for people to listen to stuff with UK accents when I was first playing early garage people ah, I don't want to hear this so there was yeah. a couple of pockets but a lot of them like you know Pete, there was there was other pockets of people that would I'd have different groups of friends that would listen to the heavy metal and then some people who'd listen to hip hop and stuff like that so yeah. and, and then I suppose through Dean through the through that what did I feel like Matt, that first kind of gig that kind of uh it was just exciting. I remember it. I remember being excited. I remember going up to the house and meeting everyone for the first time. And I was like, You've, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it, I can only explain it being feeling very pure. You know what I mean? And I would have just like, I would, I would have, I would have walked to Tremor to do that gig. Yeah. You know what I mean? I would have walked, I would have ran through the night to do that gig. I just, it was, yeah, it was just an opening to something that I can't really put into words. It was like, and it was just, it was very pure in the whole way the thing was with Irish hip hop and hip hop at the time as well. It just felt like, like I just had a lot of, a lot of like standout memories from that very first, that very first gig. Cause it was also for me, it was the very first time of feeling like, oh, what well, there's a scene here and it's not, you're not just releasing music for your own four walls. It was like, I remember going down into to Tremor for the first time and, and meeting at all urban intelligence and correct minds. And I remember walking in and hearing, I'd heard Klashnikov before, but I remember hearing Klashnikov, who's a UK MC from Hackney, actually, where I was born, who ended up kind of like changing my perspective on a lot of things. Um, I remember hearing him for the first time in a room full of like eight lads, and they're all sat down. I remember, the, I'll never forget the feeling of hearing a tune of his called It's Murder, um, or Murder. Um, I remember walking through the house and walking into the room and hearing it and feeling the, the beat and his flow on it and the vibe of everyone and that everyone was MCs there and I walked in as an MC and it was just it was just a beautiful like uh, yeah it was a beautiful kind of um, it was a beautiful foundation to learn off you know yeah I mean that's but well, you can feel it off what the way you're speaking about, about it there actually and I think 
it's interesting because I think when I was, I was one, one of these, I uh, was chatting to Lisa Dialect, to Paul, and he was saying as well that, you know, a lot of the misconceptions, especially when he was growing up are around, around hip hop um, and MC in particular, don't understand the actual much wider aspect of the culture, that it's not, you know, that it's kind of, the, the, the references into the, the supposed public mainstream can be a bit skewed. They don't understand that. Oh. And especially, and especially at the time, you know, what you what, what we were kind of, I suppose, the mainstream were kind of getting drip fed the fifties or the, you know what I mean? It was normally the extreme pop side of things, not pop. The fifty was pop by any means, but it was either the extreme pop side of things, yes, with shiny and, or it was the ultra hard stuff, which of course has its place as well, yeah. which I still listen to as well. But there was the culture from from b boy to to graphing to to the stories from being oppressed to the stories that that came out that can, that's you know connected the world through hip hop now there was a a culture that was missing that unless you are a hip hop head a lot of people outside them circles didn't understand yeah. which was also, which was also why i found um and funny you mentioned Pauly because i i, I hadn't met Pauly I don't know, I can't remember the first time we met, but we used to speak over the phone for hours and hours a night. We'd ring each other up on a house phone, yeah? And I'd sit in the living room and we'd speak about hip hop that we were listening to and MCs and that was our conversation. We could speak for hours about it. Who's in the, the last Dipset, Dipset mixtape and who, what feature did he have on it? And, um, and it, was, it was like, it was a passion that we had. You know what I mean? It was a, it was a passion, I think for us, for me anyway at the time, it connected a lot of minds and hearts that connected to hip hop, not just because they liked the sound of it, but they it, something about the culture of it and the voice of it and the meaning and the feeling that it gave us connected all of us. You know? Yeah, no, I think I, I, the more, I mean, obviously it's been very much working in Ballymun for the last 15, 16 years. I mean, it's, you know, a big part of the culture and the, and the music kind of scene around here. But what's fascinating to me about it, and similarly, you know, at the beginning, I kind of just, just knew what I, what I knew. But the more I'm hanging around with the lads and chatting to them, that whole, I mean, you know, it's kind of, that kind of really spiritual sense of, that tribal sense, do you know I mean? That sense of not, not alone finding your own voice and talking about journeys, but also finding a shared voice that can be so local and yet so inter international as well. It's kind of, it's, it's like a, an, another folk scene in, in a way. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Oh, most definitely. That's exactly what it. That's exact and like that's exactly the way I think. In years to come, it'll be looked upon like that. You know, it already is by people who know it now. But I think in years to come, when historians write on hip hop and the journey of the voice of hip hop and how it's transcended language, how it's transcended heritage and background and sound, almost it's like it's it is a it is a it is a um, there is a focus to it. Yeah, um, and I think that's that's why from all the music that I've ever listened to and still find now or whatever I, I kind of got into music of, hip hop was a natural progression to me because it just felt like the purest element of folk. It was the purest stories I'd ever heard. You yeah. know, it was direct to me and it felt like, and I'm sure that's why loads of people connected with it around the world because, you know, there was stories and storytellers were able to penetrate a whole different existence of someone who hadn't lived their lives, they hadn't lived ours, but there was a common, a common ground, you know, there's a common ground within the music, a feeling, so. But also a certain type of life lived that wasn't necessarily in the mainstream either, do you know what I mean? A kind of, a, a, you know, a, a life experience that was shared by people maybe that, that never had access to voice before, access to, or an understanding that you know like experiences of living in in New Ross or Ballymun is the same as fucking living in Brooklyn, or you know what I mean. It's that sense of of you know not poverty, but that sense of kind of you know that the issues around your area are kind of shared, and your feelings are kind of shared about it. Well, there's all, always ex, you know massive extremes, but there's a general there's a general emotional um, foundation that all of us as human beings go through. You know what I mean? Whether it's you know. Um, um, uh, substance abuse or depression or uh, domestic abuse or what we see around us in the world around us, whether it's within your home or outside your home. Um, and a lot of us around the world are affected by similar things. So, And I, I think one of the things that stood out for me was the, just the, the intimacy in someone speaking so direct. And especially, like, you know, the, the beautiful thing about for me about 
the storytelling that I fell in love with within hip hop was, it was, I was able to connect to it on an emotional level where I was hearing grown men talking about their deep feelings or depression, also talking about street stuff, also talking about history and education. And I was like, a lot of MCs educated me for the first time. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was hearing names and, and, and uh, points in history and events that I'd never heard about, either because they were across the pond and I hadn't been educated on them yet, or from when I first started listening, getting into Irish hip hop, stuff I hadn't been taught properly in school, yeah. or a perspective I hadn't been properly taught at home. You know what I mean? So it was, for me, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a history lesson as well. And it kind of made me find out and look into things in the world that made me discover a hell of a lot more about myself, but also my perception on the world. They were like teachers, you know? And was that, just at that time then, I mean, were, were you Maverick Sabre at that time? Was that? Uh, yeah, well, I, I had my, the name Maverick Sabre came because I had to set up a MySpace page. Right. And, and I was 14 and I, I remember being in school the day before I set it up and I had this, I had like a copy book and I was, because my initials are MS. So I was like, I had like 40 different, uh, uh, different makeups of MS. Like it was all these different names and Maverick Sabre, the two meanings I found for it at the time. I'm like, yeah, that really, that really, that really fits for me. You know what I mean? And so in that first gig, was that all, all your own self-written material, was that? All my own self-written, yeah. Self, self-produced beats um, and self, self-written material, yeah. And, and did you have, because an awful lot of the lads around here spoke around about the time of kind of you know, finding their own accent and their own voice. Was that very much for you at the beginning as well, that it was you, yourself? That it wasn't? Oh, it was a complete learn. it was a, no, it was a complete learning curve for me. It was a complete learning curve because what it did was it kind of highlighted a kind of like an insecurity in me as a child as well, coming into Irish hip hop, coming into hip hop and just having your voice out there anyway. Because for me, one of the big things about me growing up was there was an element of an identity with me. It was like I was so connected to London and all the larger percentage of my family were in London on my mom's side. My cousins, I never really had, I had second cousins and stuff in, in Ireland, but a large percentage of my cousins um, and where I was getting a lot of fed information and music from and culture was also in London. But then I was so attached and connected to what I was, you know, being brought up around my Irishness that there was always this balance of like, I always had a weird little mixed accent growing up. And when I started spitting, I was like, I hadn't heard, for a start, I hadn't heard any Irish accents to have any connection to. So I was like, I'm not gonna sound American, which was the only other option. I was even hearing English MCs trying to sound American. So I was like, that don't feel right. And I was like, the stuff I was connecting with the most at the time, because I hadn't been introduced to Irish hip hop yet, being honest, was Dizzy. Dizzy was, so I was like, oh, a Dizzy who, was who I wanted to sound like. I was like, nah, 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 hard and rough and high pitched and, and I was like, I can, I can do an English accent straight up. I go back every summer, I'm connected to Hackney. I was like, and it was part of me as well. So I was like, I speak, this is kind of half how I speak anyway. And I, I would, there was an element of me that would put it on in the music, you know what I mean? Because it was me, I suppose when I look back, it was me finding an identity. Yeah. It was me like, I don't know, no one's telling me what my identity is. So I need to find one myself, you know? Um, and then I remember Dean, I remember Dean, I remember this so well, Dean ringing me up one day and being like, <laughs> he rang me on the phone, I remember I was like, I'm, I'm, it was still around the same time, so I might have been like 16 or something at the time, and I was outside of a pub in the countryside, and he rang me up and he was like, Matt, you sound a bit like a culty. <laughs> yeah, there's an element of your accent that's culty, and I was like, I've never been called a culty before in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 I know it might sound so simplistic, yeah, but, it had such an impact on my mind as a young kid because no, I hadn't felt like anyone had been straight with me like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was like, it, it made me process stuff. Like, how do I, what, what am I supposed to sound like? You know, what, where is my identity? What is, what is, what is uh, the message that I'm, you know, I, I was always from early on trying to push a really strong message in my music. I was like, well, if I don't necessarily a hundred percent sound like myself, how do I find that? And it took a long while for me to find that. I'll be very honest. It took a long while for me to find myself. On one side, I was massively secure and, 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 knew, uh, 
and knew my message and knew my what I wanted to say and how to perform. And I was confident in that. But my voice, even my singing voice, I, it took me years to find it. You know what I mean? As a performer, it's like, where do we, where do we sit? Where's our, our identity? And I, I'd probably say it wasn't until I moved back to London at 17 um, and started to learn more about myself that I found, I found, I found my identity and I, I, I kind of became more comfortable in my voice. So, I mean, like, I, I think, what, 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 I mean, I'm a big fan of your music and I think what's really interesting about it is it has that, it has all those elements that you've spoken about, well, maybe not Limp Biscuit, but it, it, has all, <laughs> it has all those elements, you know, you can hear the Beatles, you can hear, you can hear early soul, you can certainly hear, hear hip hop, but I'm just wondering, like, when you went back to the UK, um, like, where did that sound emerge for you? Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you kind of had, as I say, you kind of went down the hip hop route, and then you kind of, you found this, I don't know, you found this kind of new space. Now, there are, there are a few, few artists that kind of work across genres, obviously. But yeah, you, yeah. You, you, when you hear your tracks, you know it's you. Uh, I think that came out of, I started, I'd always been playing guitar, but when I started doing shows, uh, I was just, I was, it was backing track. I'd, I'd make the beats, I'd bounce them, I'd put them on a CD and whatever shows I was doing, it was, it was the backing track. And I kind of, it started to wear on me a tiny bit that I felt like I could make, I could make a beat, you know, bang hard to a, a PA but how many people were actually hearing what I was saying. And I was, my performance style at the time was mad aggressive. So I was, and I was high pitched and I was like, rock the house, this young fella. I just, that for me, it was like, there was a, in writing, there was a, like always a beautiful message and it was from such a pure place. But when I was performing, it was, which I loved at the time because it was the energy of where I was at in my own head. But I felt, I started to get annoyed because I felt like, how many people are actually hearing what I'm saying here? Why am I sitting down and, and, and spending so much time trying to write stories if the beat's banging too hard for people to hear and I'm not slowing down and I'm not articulating myself enough for people to actually take the story in. So I started to do gigs with my guitar um, and that's when I started to sing more because I was like, well, no one's going to sing these choruses so I've got no one to sing these choruses. So I started to, I was rapping the verses and then I would, I would pick a song that I would have like... Uh, that was that had no singing on it. I'd take the verses and I'd make a set out of it. So I'd have like six tunes, six different songs, that's two verses for each each song. And then I'd write a chorus, singing first chorus for each one. Mm. Um, and then I started doing my sets like that. Um, and then before I moved back to London, I'd come to London um, on and off. Um, and I remember... Uh, great friend of mine DJ Flip who's uh, fantastic um, kind of pioneer for a lot of things especially on the uh, um, on a DJ and scratching side for Irish hip hop um, he got me a show in Bethnal Green I think it was um, when I was about 17 it was my first show in London playing on the guitar and I did a show with him and then did a couple of um, underground hip hop nights um, just me on the guitar and it just felt like, and I'd, I'd, I'd done another show back in Dublin supporting Speech to Bell, who just won the Mercury Prize at the time, I think with the Informatics or something like that. And um, these were my first kind of set of gigs that I was doing stripped back. And it just felt like it immediately clicked more. It clicked more with me because, don't get me wrong, I, I'm all, and I always will be, till my death, be a Boom Bap fan, yeah? And I will always make that. But there was something about the directness of my voice, my style of playing on the guitar, being able to slow songs down and making people hear the lyrics and feel the tone of voice, mm. that just felt right. Um, um, and uh, yeah, that was it. And then it kind of grew from now. What were you writing about at that stage? Was there a kind of, was there a theme across your music or was it kind of, uh, was it dependent? Like, was there, you know, you were saying there about, you know, the, the pureness of, I'm just fascinated by your early stuff. What, what was kind of, you know, what was your inspiration coming from what was around you or was it kind of, you know, where did, where, where did you go looking for stuff? Uh, for me, I don't know, stories just came to me, you know what I mean? I was, I was, for me, I was, fat, like, the, the songs that fascinated me when I was younger were stories like, um, 
the hurricane hurricane by bob dylan or brenda's got a baby by tupac it was visual stories it was um it was reflections on society society it was reflections on maybe the people around them and their attitudes and but it was also like really just strong stories that that could connect universally um so for me it was just one the main thing was just what i saw around me what i saw in my own town what i saw around about young men around me you know what i mean um which for me was always inspiring enough from whether it was depression or, or whether it was just our, our kind of daily struggles with anything, with schooling, with not schooling, with no work or whatever it was at the time, just kind of what I saw around me. But it was also like, um, I don't know, I was, I was just, I was kind of like, and I always have been um, fascinated with human interaction and, and, uh, and stories about, I remember, being um, taken aback by school shootings in America at the time. And I remember seeing um, Bowling for Columbine. Um, and I remember hearing a song by, uh, I think it was Ill Bill. It was a, a rapper who was um, on Necro's label. I can't remember the name of it, um, the label, but they were all quite dark. All the songs were quite dark. They had, he had this beautiful song called The Anatomy of a School Shooting. And, uh, and it went into the psychology of the school shooter, which I thought was... You know, fascinating. I kind of went on a on a dip of looking at interviews, um, and this was what I used to do if I found a story that, that interested me. I'd, I'd go on, I'd look up as, as many interviews with either the family, with people who'd been affected by it, with with people who lost loved ones, and and try and find like the general consensus of one where did it, where does the psychology of all this come back from, it? and and what people's thoughts around the actions of it. And you know, there was a certain group of people that you can see that they were just completely ostracized from day one and even to the point of you know after the actions which were obviously horrendous and tragedies that this the the ideas of social constructs still fitted in you know and you could kind of see the the social constructs were a lot of the reasoning behind a lot of these breakups and 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 mental health issues in schools and um and it just fascinated me and i and uh so I kind of went in and, I'd, and then I'd, I'd write songs on it. And I wrote, like, They Found Them Gone, which ended up being on my first album about that. Um, and that's kind of like, that's just kind of like one story off. But that's kind of how I would get interested in other stories. So it would either be things that I'd seen around me, things that were going on personally within me, or just stories about humans that I just, I just found massively interesting and inspiring. That stuff there about the kind of research, that's, that, that's a huge amount of work. I mean, that's, that, that's a writer, do you know what I mean? That's kind of, and that's fascinating. And I suppose it was, what again, because people looking at kind of, you know, maybe that look at hip hop or even look at songwriting and kind of see it as a different art form to say, writing, writing or novel writing or, you know, but I mean, they are different art forms, but it's the same process. It's the same kind of construct of making something. And I'm wondering for you, as your work has kind of, grown over, over the last number of years and as you say kind of developing choruses with guitar has it has the chicken and, and the egg changed like do you have you have you written stuff now from the from the guitar basis first or is it always from from the MC element uh that kind of changed to be honest it was it, it kind of like when i when i initially started playing the guitar it was completely writing writing as an MC and then singing it. And it was like, right, how can I put melody to this, which will connect with more people? And then verses that I'd, I'd written rapping at home every day, I'd sit on the guitar, slow them down slightly, have the same rhythm, same flow, but put melody to it. And then I started to find my own tone through that. Uh, and then for the first album, it was a lot, the majority of it was all rapping. Mm. And then I sang it. Um, and then that kind of changed as time went on. But like, strangely enough, I went through a bit of a writer's block. It kind of, it can't, the, the beautiful thing about the guitar is it always comes back when, 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 I, when I need it, really, to be honest. And I, at the end of last year, I went, a bit, went through a bit of a writer's block and, and I hadn't sat down on the guitar and written anything for, for ages, for months. And, uh, and I was going into sessions and, we were working over other people's production and, and just stuff wasn't really clicking for me for a while. And then I went away and uh, I went to a, a friend's house and she lives massively out in the countryside and there's no Wi-Fi, there's no anything. And, um, and I picked up a guitar 
found some old guitar. And it, for the first time in months, I started writing on the guitar and it was back to like how I used to write. It was the guitar was inspiring me rather than the other way around and taking stuff to the guitar. And, um, it kind of like uh, got the juices going in that, in that element again. So it kind of dips in and out, to be honest. It's, it's all... And when things started then to happen for you, you know, when things started to kind of motor for you, what, what was that like? You know, uh, it's a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest. It's a bit of a whirlwind. Like I think the whole thing's a bit of a whirlwind for me, to be honest. And uh, um, I suppose in hindsight, you can look back and go, "Oh, bloody hell!" That was, you know, at the time, just so much is going on. It was like it's just it was a weird. It was like, you know, I was. I was 19, I, I, was seven, I was 17 when I moved back here. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, that was done on a whim. I, I literally packed my bag two weeks before I left. And I was like, I'm off. I had nowhere to stay. Had no idea where I was going to stay. And my aunt, thankfully, put me up for a while. And then I stayed. Luckily, I stayed with uh, Plan B at the time, who was a massive influence over me. And he kind of like took me under his wing and taught me, taught me a couple of... Um, you know, kind of like valuable lifelong lessons in writing and stuff like that when I was staying with him. Um, and he'd give me studio sessions and stuff like that. Um, then went on the road with him. And then I, all in the background, I was still, I was doing loads of open mic nights. Um, I was still doing loads of sessions and connecting with people. Um, so I was doing a hell of a lot of work before it kind of really, really clicked and I got signed. And and yeah, just around that, then I was like, you know, I signed when I was 19. I was, I, I, I'd come back. I'd come back home for my 18th birthday. Ended up getting stuck back there for a city reason. I had to work for a while, and then when I could come back here, I came back and I was on the dole. I was doing. I was. I've had. I was. I was on the dole. I was. Uh, I was kind of like doing shows here, um, like not paid shows, but like doing open mics. Because open mics at the time were big. You know, they were massive here. Um, so you could really, really, you know, you could really put a lot of groundwork into just doing open mics. Um, so I was doing that quite a lot. Um, and, yeah, just, I don't know, it's just the ball started rolling, really. Went on my first tour. Plan B took us on our first tour around the UK. I was kind of, eight. I was 18, 19. And then off the back of that, labels started talking, um, and I found my home with Universal at the time um, when I was, I think I was, I think I was just between 19 and 20, something like that. Um, and yeah, and then it was just, I don't know, it was mad. As you can imagine, like I was, I was 18, I was living out of a suitcase. I was kind of on the dole, coming back and forth. I was kind of in no man's land, but I loved it. And I was in, you know what I mean? I wasn't really making any money, but. It was like I was between a like a, a, a really pure Irish hip hop scene that I was getting mad inspiration from, but then I was also in London around the time of like you know it was um, what was it two thousand and seven at the time, so it was kind of like grime was still in its real raw stage, and there was a, there was like a purity here that I absolutely buzzed off as well. So yeah. it was just it was just a beautiful time. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting though. I mean, like you know that. The scene, you, you seem to be very grounded within all that from, from the way it kind of started for you. I mean, and I think, you know, Plan B was mostly huge around that time. Yeah. You know, and it also existed in that kind of hybrid space, you know, that kind of... Massively. Origin of his own kind of space. And then, so when you when things kicked off, and there you are, and now, you know, the, over the last 10, 12 years, you're in a whole different kind of arena in relation to... You know, is there a sense of being on a, a different wheel or being in it? Like, how do you maintain norm normality within that kind of the demands that are sometimes put on you? How how do I say that again? I that like the sound. Kind of... How do you ma 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 maintain a sense of being grounded when kind of some of the of the demands that are put, put on you because of you know the scene or, or the, the the industry that you're in? Uh, I don't know. Like, on on being on on how to stay grounded, I think it's a choice along the way I think being grounded is the same way as being grounded in life in general it's just yeah. music's got a magnifying glass on it and everything's everything just gets a bit mental with it. you know you know everything that can come into um, being in the music industry there's a lot of falsenesses and there's a lot of money there's a lot of success there's a lot of failures there's a lot of everything you know what I mean yeah. so 
I think grounding is just about people that you keep around you, in my opinion. And mm. and and um, it's a choice. It's to to remind yourself of you know of of the graft you put in, where you came from, the appreciation for everyone. You know, and I think that's just a general thing in life that you have to kind of keep in mind. But um, yeah, I suppose yeah, kind of going back to like the journey of it. It's uh. I don't know, for me, it always comes back down to the pure love for music. That Nothing for me will ever exceed that, you know? And it's like, like an example, uh, if this is fucking a good example at all, but um, I remember meeting, meeting Klashnikov for the first time. And Klashnikov was someone, like I said, was in, I was introduced to at a time when one, I was trying to find myself as a young man. And two, I'd, I'd almost, I'd become part of this beautiful scene, Irish hip hop, which gave me all these same feelings. I was hearing young fellas around me speaking about things that were going on down the road that were connected with one side of me. But then there was Klashnikov mm -hmm. that connected with my London side of me that was connected to Hackney. And I was hearing streets that I'd, that I'd known and family lived on and I was connected to that side. So... There was something, you know, really powerful about him and his words to me when I was younger. Um, when I finally got to meet him, which was only about four years ago, and I've met loads of people, you know, and I'm not, not to be like, I'm not really phased by people, but I'm not. Unless you've, like, really connected with me, and I'm not really phased. I, I treat everyone exactly the same, but I'm not going to be, ah, not, that's not my vibe, really. But when I met him, it was the first time yeah. where I felt like I'm sitting watching a master here. You t I didn't want to speak for the first night that I met him. I was just like, you've had such an impact on my whole life and the way I've thought. And you've changed, like, you've changed moments of my life as I've walked to school. You've changed the way I've thought before I got into the school doors. Like, you've, been, you've been on walks with me when I was 15. You know what I mean? Like, and it, and it, for me, it was like, that's why I do music. I don't know how to explain that, but... I, I hear you. It's like, for me, that keeps me grounded because it's a reminder and it's like, what keeps me grounded is my dad just put out an album last, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. I got reviewed in the New Standard and he's ringing and we're chatting about the songs and the breakdown of the writing. Like that's, and he gets love out of it. I get inspired out of it. Whoever hears it, it's like, oh, this is, this is great. It's not done for anything other than, do you love the music? Yeah, you do. Have you connected with someone? Yeah. Have you connected with yourself? Yeah. I don't know. That for me was, is, is, it's the music that keeps me grounded rather than myself, if that well, makes sense. It is funny because, I mean, like, you know, there's, when I met you, when you came over, of course, it could be three or four years ago now, to, um, with Dean and with John Connors and Terry to kind of do the work with the, the young lads or to collaborate with the young lads on our Creative Space project. It's that sense of grace or that sense of just, I mean, I think, I think real is a very overused word, but I think it's just people being themselves. And I think that's a huge, it's a huge thing to be that like, you know, that people in the arts generally are just trades people. They do what they do, what they do. And, and the other, the other shite's a choice. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is. But, I, but I think you can, you can see those young lads that you're working with here just go, all oh, right, he's just talking to us. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think that's, that, that might sound very simple, but that gift, and just what you said there about listening to Kalishnikov when you're going to school at 15 and changing the way you're thinking, that's so true. That's kind of, and you saying about him that he, you, he went for a walk with you. I mean, that's such a beautiful way of saying it, you know? Yeah, but, and, and, that, and that for me was like, and, I, and like I did, um, I did um, something for District Magazine the other day and they asked, it was like uh, uh, 10 songs that change your life. And I, I, I enjoy doing stuff like that because I can, as you can tell, I can just babble on so much that I forget what I'm even talking about. But I, I joined it, I was like, I was like, and I said to him, I was like, lad, I feel like I've always mentioned the exact same tunes about the 10 cent. They're not always the same, but they're kind of like similar artists, two packs of Dylan, Bob Marley, and you know, a bit of demos in there. And you know what I mean? And I'm like, but then when I do think about it, it, it comes back to the, the idea of what music connected with, with me the most. It was stuff that told me a story that I connected to, stuff that made me not feel alone. And uh, 
stuff that just made me all feel interconnected with things, you know, and teach me stuff. Yeah. And it was, it was the resistance music. It was resistance, not just socially and politically resistance, which also still always gets me the most. It was like resistance to our own emotions, like, you know, powerful music that got you out of that, whether it was speaking about injustice in society and in politics or in the system. It was also the injustice we do to ourselves as well, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and, it, and, it, and for me, that's what I think, you know, yeah, it's not about stuff that, stuff that we were sold to uh, about, you know, the idea of an, an artist. There was always, I always remember coming into Universal for the first time and then pushing this big thing. You need, you need we need stars. Yeah, we need stars. This is always a big talk. We need stars. Yeah, and there was always a big thing of like, <clears throat> you need to wear a hat. You need something that make, makes you an individual. Yeah? And I was like, I just never, that shit never clicked with me. I was just like, but for me, the idea of why all them artists connected with me was, it wasn't because they were on a pedestal and they were unattainable. And they washed off and spoke about things that I didn't have any understanding. So I was just up and idolizing, which is how they hook you in. It was because they spoke about things that made me feel on a level with them and connected. And I was like, and that, so it's, for me, it was just, that's, that's always my ethos and will always be my ethos for everything. Come here, I won't keep much longer, but I just want to, a couple of questions I want to ask you, literally, because in the last number of years, like the intimate rooms have kind of, grown an awful lot bigger, you know what I mean, in, in relation to listenership and obviously, you know, the festivals and gigs that you play. And how has that journey been for you? Um, the live side of things is all, like, I've always loved live. You know, for me, live's where I feel most at home in the whole setting. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's uh, I suppose, again, it's a, it's a strange one because you can look back and reflect on time, on, 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 um, you know, certain massive gigs or certain moments. Um, but at the time, it's like, it's a bit of a whirlwind, you know, like they kind of gradually, stuff gradually happens in the, it's, it's only really in hindsight where you're like, bloody hell, I just, I played in front of 40,000 people there. Or, you know what I mean? It was like, so moments like that, you kind of, uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're strange, they're strange to look back on, but. But was there, was there ever a, a moment, though, say, say in, the, in the midst of one of those, where you're kind of looking at it and going, sweet Jesus Christ, what, what you know? <laughs> um, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, does, does one ever get the opportunity to kind of stand there and kind of go, you know, what, what how, how did this happen? Yeah, I think, I think more recent, the mo most recent moment I remember that was um, we played Glastonbury last year. And we headlined um, the Sonic stage on the Sunday, and we were the, I think the second, we were the last, we were the last live band build, the last build live band of the Sunday night, right? So after that it was like DJs and yeah, a couple of choirs and stuff. We were the last build band, and I'm thinking like, all right, it's a Sunday evening, you know, a lot of people know me from my soul stuff. Are they, are they, are they gonna come? Are they gonna come to? Uh, I, stay, I don't know if I would come to it, like, you know, I was just thinking of all the worst outcomes, yeah? So I'm like, look, I'd be happy with a quarter of the tent full at, in the current circumstance, right? And, um, and we came on and the tent was like, I don't know, it was like 10 or 12,000 people in the tent. And, and for the first time in ages, it was one of the moments where I was in there and I was like, and we were playing a lot of the new stuff from the new record and it was, but it was really connecting. And I remember playing Drifting. And uh, and I remember just having a moment, like, I don't know if we, I've already sworn on this anyway, but uh, I, I remember having a moment and being on stage and just feet, I was just as connected as one could ever be to anything. And I was just like, this is what I'm fucking here for. And I remember saying it out loud, and I was like, nah, because I had... I was like, it was also a, a talk to myself that had doubts of sitting inside the stage, like, which you do, you prepare yourself for the worst outcome. Um, and I was just like, yeah, right, this is beautiful. This is, this is, why, this is how I'm supposed to feel. You know what I mean? So you have moments. Some, yeah. Sometimes you rarely get to appreciate them in the moment. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. That, yeah. that was one of the ones where I looked out and I could have just like, yeah. I get these weird emotions of wanting to like, be like be passionately aggressive if that makes any sense. <laughs> or, 
That's, that's actually a great phrase. <laughs> Passionately aggressive, but yeah. So there's been there's been there's been lovely moments. You know what I mean? That, um, but that that's a really that's a fantastic. I mean, it's a fantastic. Your last album, in particular, is brilliant. And I think drifting for me, obviously, the connections with kind of the vid video in in, in with, with the lads, <laughs> Bonnie, and everything. But I just think that yeah, there's a sense of from the outside looking in, and, and particularly at festivals like Glastonbury, the sounds that kind of cut across, and that song in particular, I can imagine. You know that feeling, and it's really weird and sad in a way when we're all stuck now, unable to go to gigs or unable to kind of be yeah. in those moments to to remember back to those times when you you were you were allowed, you know, or circumstances allowed us have those moments. Yeah, and it, there's there's a tribalness to it. We are, like as humans, we're I think we're best when we're together. Sometimes, like you know, I think solitude's great for our own mental kind of stability and knowing of ourselves, but. I think we're meant to be beside each other. Like no one, no one can say to me, especially if anyone's been to a Damien Dempsey gig at Christmas, yeah, or in general. But no one can say to me that when you're standing in a crowd full of thousands of people, or hundreds of people, or tens of people, and you're singing passionately the same song together, that there isn't a special moment that you think this is beautiful. Yeah, this is what yeah. we need to. There's an element that is we need to take into our everyday interactions with people because you're standing beside a complete stranger and you're up close and, oh, this is beautiful. And you're looking at them like we're all in love. And that's, there's something very special with that. You know what I mean? Which is why music festivals are so, and that's why Glastonbury is like a, it's like a, it's like a religious ceremony for people to go every year, you know? Um, so, so stuff like that. And Drifting as well was, you know, it's, it's a song as close to my heart as nearly any song I've ever made because it was literally made in this exact spot I'm sitting here now. Wow. At four o'clock in the morning and it was it was made completely as an experimental idea that I was going to put out under another name wearing a balaclava in a field that no one was going to ever know was me. And then I was like, and it was like through my couple of friends like, no, you should put this out yourself. So going on and playing at Glastonbury, not being one of the big kind of like like soul ballads or anything like that, being kind of like experimental from other stuff and still connecting just was like, you know, a confirmation for me to, you know, yeah, I don't know, but yeah. Come here, listen, thanks a million, Matt, for, for doing this. It's been an absolute... Oh, mate, oh, no, all good. And no, all good. If, you, if you stay sitting there before in the morning, maybe you might write another classic for us all. Oh, mate, we've got, yeah, 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 we will, we will, we definitely will, yeah, yeah. I'll chat to you soon, sir. All right, brother, lovely, take no care, worries. yeah.